We present to you our project over Virginia Woolf's The Mark on the Wall by Gabby, Alondra, and Reagan. Hi, I'm Gabby Amaro, and I'll be reading Virginia Woolf's biography and the work cited page. Hi, my name's Alondra Orduna, and I'll be reading the summary of The Mark on the Wall and the interesting facts. Hi, I'm Reagan Sumro. I read the title and I'll be reading the historical time period when the mark on the wall was written and Virginia Woolf's other major works. I'm Gabby and I'll be reading the biographical information of Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf's actual name was Adeline Virginia Stephen. She was born on January 25th, 1882 in London, England to father Leslie Stephen and mother Julia Jackson. Both of her parents were ideal Victorians. Wolfe's father was the first editor of the Dictionary of National Biography and her mother was beautiful and known for self-sacrifice. Julia also had astonishing social and artistic connections which included Julia Margaret Cameron, her aunt, and one of the greatest portrait photographers of the 19th century. Both of Wolfe's parents were previously married. Herbert Duckworth, Julia Jackson's first husband, and William Makepeace Thackeray's daughter, Leslie Stevens' previous wife, both died unexpectedly. So Julia and Leslie were left as widows. Julia was left three kids, and Leslie was left one. Julia and Leslie married in 1878. After the wedding, they had four children together within five years. Vanessa, Thoby, Virginia, and Adrian. That gave Julia and Leslie a total of eight children to raise. Originally, the four full siblings banded together against their older siblings. However, they eventually went against one another. Virginia was jealous of Thoby for being their mom's favorite. At the age of nine, Virginia was the author of the family newspaper Hyde Park Gate News and was often teased by Vanessa and Adrian. The oldest full sibling, Vanessa, acted as a mother to the other children. But between Virginia's neediness and Vanessa's desire to be left alone, there was sometimes a rivalry between the sisters' writing and painting. The large family made annual summer trips from their London townhouse in Kensington Gardens to their rather rugged house on the Cornwall coast. The yearly relocation made Virginia's childhood full of opposites, such as city and country, winter and summer, and wholeness and fragmentation. However, her predictable life was turned upside down in 1895. Julia, Virginia's mother, passed away at the age of 49. Virginia was only 13 and saddened she put her amusing family newspaper to a halt. Almost a whole year later, Virginia finally wrote a cheerful letter to her brother, Thoby. Just as she was getting out of depression, her half-sister, Stella Duckworth, passed away in 1897 at the age of 28. Virginia noted this loss as impossible to write of in her diary. Despite personal losses, Virginia continued her studies in German, Greek, and Latin at the Ladies' Department of King's College, London. Her four years of study introduced her to ideas of feminism and education reforms. Then in 1904, Leslie Stephen died of stomach cancer and Virginia had a nervous breakdown. Then after a family trip in Greece, Thoby died of typhoid fever in 1906. This time, Virginia was sad but didn't go into depression. Vanessa and Adrian decided to sell the family home and purchased one in the Bloomsbury area of London. During this time, Virginia met several members of the Bloomsbury Group, a circle of intellectuals and artists. Vanessa married one of the group members, Clive Bell. Virginia overcame the loss of Thoby and the so-called loss of Vanessa to writing. In 1910, the Bloomsbury group became famous for the dreadnought hooks, a practical joke. After this outrageous act, Virginia became close with Leonard Wolf. They married on August 10, 1912. Despite her excellence in writing, Virginia Wolf battled deep depression throughout her life and committed suicide on March 28, 1941 at the age of 59. I'm Reagan and I'll be reading the historical time period of the mark on the wall. During Virginia Woolf's life, there were many changes 
occurring in the world such as mental health, World War I, and women's rights. Even though people's anxiety began to be super provoked as the modern industrialization was up and coming, mental health became a true issue as wars progressed. The eye-opening event was soldiers experiencing shell shock. Soldiers with shell shock experienced symptoms such as tics, trembling, functional paralysis, hysterical deafness and blindness, speech disorders ranging from stuttering to mutism, confusion, extreme anxiety, amnesia, depression, cramps, fainting, and vomiting. The first mental casualties occurred in 1914 after the Battle on Mons. Shell shock raised awareness for mental health, but help and resources were still very limited, as was knowledge. World War I began July 28, 1914, when Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated. The war was between the Allies and the Central Powers, and the Allies ended up with the victory. World War I ended on November 11th of 1918. Remembrance Day is each year on November 11th to honor the ones who fought and lost their lives during the war. The number of American women who participated in World War I made the 5 million men serving in armed forces look like a small number. The women's abrupt entrance, entrance into war and public life brought along injustice of American life into relief. Women died in the war, yet they could not vote for what was happening. This realization helped women gain the right that they had been fighting for for nearly 70 years. President Woodrow Wilson even stated that the women's vote was vitally essential to the successful prosecution of the great war of humanity in which we are engaged. For clarification, the mark on the wall was originally published in 1917. Wolf began writing this short story at the height of World War I. This war touched the lives of many English citizens. Germany began bombing England in 1915, so England enlisted their citizens as soldiers in January of 1916 under the Military Service Bill. Wolfe uses the influence of the war on the citizens by referencing the war as it interrupts her narrator's thoughts consistently throughout the story. Also, during the early 20th century, there were great changes in social norms and technological development that all began with the Industrial Revolution. During this time, women's rights had great gains which played a major role in Wolfe's work. Women's suffrage was introduced a year after the publication of The Mark on the Wall in 1918. This is Reagan again, and I'll be reading the other major works that were also written by Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf was best known for her novels. Two of her most famous works were Miss Dalloway, published in 1925, and To the Lighthouse, published in 1927. A few other novels from Wolfe include Orlando, A Biography, 1928, A Room of One's Own, 1929, The Waves, 1931, and Between the Acts, 1941. Miss Dalloway is one of the best books to read when you first encounter works of Wolfe. It tells the story of a high-class English woman after World War I. To the Lighthouse is told from varying perspectives. It focuses on the hardships of a family that lives in a house on the coast of Scotland. Orlando, a biography, is said to be Wolfe's most intense novel. This novel explores questions of gender and identity. A Room of One's Own develops on the involvements women have. It claims without money and a room of their own, 
women cannot be creative or have their thoughts run free. The Waves is a book that is composed of six monologues composed by the main characters of the story. Wolf uses this to divulge into identity, society, and individuality. Between the Acts was Virginia Woolf's last work and was published after her death. It is set in an anonymous location in England as the Second World War outbreaks throughout the country. In addition to these novels, Wolf also wrote essays over artistic theory, literary history, women's writing, and the politics of power. She also sent her family and friends a great amount of letters, as well as experimented with many different forms of biographical writing and short fiction. Hi, I am Alondra. I'll be reading the summary of The Mark on the Wall by Virginia Woolf. On a day in January, after tea, the narrator sits in her living room while reading and smoking a cigarette. <clears throat> she looks at her fireplace and the burning coals of the fire reminder of a group of knights, but she is then distracted by a black mark on the wall above her mantle. She wonders how it got there. Was it left by a nail that was used by the people who lived in the house before her? After deciding the mark was too large to have been a nail, the narrator thinks about the mystery of life and uncertainty of her thought. She then composes a list of all things that she has lost in her life. Bookbinding tools, bird cages, a hand organ, and even jewels. Then she compares life itself to a wild and rough ride on a tube and mourns life's wastefulness and hazardous nature. Soon after, the narrator realizes that the mark is not a hole and wonders if it could be a rose leaf. She compares dust on the mantle to the dust that buried Troy and considers herself to be a terrible housekeeper. A tree taps on the window outside, and the narrator imagines Shakespeare sitting in an armchair in front of a fire-like hearse. She wishes for a peaceful life without interruption. The historic fiction about Shakespeare is boring to her, and she yearns to have peaceful thoughts that would allow her to reflect well upon herself. She dwells on her self-image and constantly dresses up herself in her mind. The narrator wonders what will happen if her internal romanticized self was to disappear. If this happened, the only reflections left would be in the eyes of strangers, which she thinks novelists will write in the future. The narrator also considers the habits that define oneself that changes across generations. This leads her to think of the illegitimate freedoms that come with time as it passes. The narrator focuses back on the mark on the wall and notices that it rises from the wall. She believes it might be a nail that was painted over, but has revealed itself over time. She thinks about the barrows on the south downs that retire colonels explored to determine if they belong to camps or tombs. The narrator decides to stand up to study the marking, knowing that knowledge is uncertain. Men have learned to follow as in the steps of hermits and witches. She prefers to picture the world without specialists where thoughts only resemble experience so that she can use them to experience the natural world. The narrator comes to the realization that her preoccupation with the mark on the wall is an act of self-preservation. She knows that she cannot take action against Whitaker's table of presidency, but she can put an end to arguable thoughts. She wants to find pleasant thoughts, so she focuses on the tree that is growing outside and creating 
and environment, animals, insects, waters, and other plants. She thinks of a tree's lifespan throughout the seasons and its afterlife, such as in human homes. Then, a voice interrupts the narrator's thought, and she is drugged back into the living room. A person stands over her, saying he wants to purchase a newspaper, despite the news of the never-ending war. He then complains about the snow that sits on the wall, and the narrator realizes that the mark on the wall has been a snow the whole time. Again, I'm Alondra, and I'll be reading the interesting facts of The Mark on the Wall, as well as Virginia Woolf. The Mark on the Wall has characteristics that classify it under modernism. One characteristic of modernism is to seek awareness where there was not any beforehand. The short story does just that by exemplifying exemplifying self-awareness. The mark on the wall also had a theme of gender roles. For an example, the first law of women's suffrage was passed in 1918 in the United Kingdom. This happens to be one year after the short story was published. Wolf wrote a majority of her fictional work about female protagonists as well as addressed inequalities between men and women. In addition, Wolf wrote and published The Mark on the Wall, while World World I was across Europe. This war, this war, war had devastating effects on life in London. In 1915, Germany began bombing the city. Wolf wrote diary entries and other stories about the unpredictable destruction caused by the fighting. Here are a few interesting facts about the author Virginia Woolf. Firstly, Virginia and her husband, Leonard, ran the Hogarth Press. They received the manuscript of the first few chapters of Ulysses, but had to turn away the publication because it was not possible to print the entire book on their hand press. Secondly, James Paddle was Virginia's maternal great-grandfather, and he purposely drank himself to death. Tragic. In 1936, Wolf wrote, I think he had genius and no talent. She was referring to Tom, Thomas Hardy's skills as a writer. However, she did praise him for having a capacity for moments of vision. Wolf's autobiography moment of being is clearly a tribute to Hardy. In April of 1935, Regina and her husband drove the streets of Germany as part of their annual holiday despite the occurring military reconstruction by Hitler. By Hitler. And lastly, T.S. Eliot San Virginia Wolf funny rhymes, satires, or jokes about the difference in their reputations quite often. This is Gabby, and I'm reading the Works Cited page. We use one website to gather our pictures, and we also use nine internet sites as well as our class textbook to gain information over this short story written by Virginia Wolf. We hope you all enjoyed the presentation and learned a little bit. Thanks for watching. Gabby, Alondra, and Reagan.